Hi, Jonah. <laughs> Thank you so Hi. much for joining me today. It's an absolute honor to have you. Um, from what I know about you, you uh, were raised in the yoga tradition, and I've actually had the privilege of taking a class with you out here in Venice. You're the first person that inspired me to actually come out here. So it's a, uh, a pleasure to be able to talk to you. And um, beyond being a yoga teacher, I know that you offer international yoga retreats and um, teacher training certificates. Uh, you have meditations on Spotify uh, mm -hmm. through your partnership with ZenStop, I believe. Yeah, and uh, you're also a Nike ambassador, so the list goes on. So I'm really uh, happy to have you here today. So yes, welcome. Thank you so much for the sweet intro, and I'm glad we got to share a few cool moments a few days ago in Venice. That was super awesome. Of course, of course. So I just would like to start off uh, the interview just um, by asking you to just, I guess, tell me a little bit about yourself and your journey and how you were introduced to the yoga practice and specifically pranayama. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I, like you said, I come from a family of yogis. My father, Johnny Kest, uh, and my uncle, Brian Kest, both were introduced to yoga at the age of 12 by their father. Oh, wow. I didn't know. Yeah, so they were, they were kind of forced to do it at a young age. So the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And um, they were brought to India at a young age, I believe about 14 for my father, and kind of, you know, immersed them. And and it's kind of a long story, but essentially, you know, my grandfather ended up moving to Hawaii. And at the time, there was a guy named David Williams, who was one of the first Americans to bring Patabi Joyce to okay. the United States from India. And um, Patabi Joyce, if you're not familiar, was the guy who founded Ashtanga Yoga. Yes. Um, so lots of pranayama within Ashtanga, you know, specifically yeah. Ujjayi, um, yeah. which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute here. But um yeah, so that was kind of like the, the natural evolution. And then it goes kind of into a complex story. But essentially, now I'm here. And, you know, my father was a yoga teacher. So I kind of just grew up in it. It was something we didn't really have a choice, you know, growing up, it was we were all pulled out of bed, um, <laughs> uh, dragged into the vinyasa classes on 945, you know, on Sundays. I can imagine when you were young. <laughs> appreciate but now i'm sure you do for sure you know we were we were dragged and sometimes we just lay on our mat and sleep the whole class and you know others times we i think felt inspired i think i was drawn to the to the physically challenging poses you know just because i was like a young a young boy at the time and and needed something like that but um yeah definitely came in waves and and i think the inspiration was always there i always saw my father as like a cool guy you know sometimes i was embarrassed by him because he would always be doing handstands in front of my friends <laughs> like you know <laughs> That's so cool. I couldn't find that I could do that. <laughs> He'd come into our uh, every year, like my teachers in elementary school would invite him to come in and share yoga with the class. So, you know, it was always like deeply ingrained and, and really everything we did. I wouldn't say we're like necessarily the stereotypical yoga family, if there is one where, you know, it's so peaceful and Zen in the house, you know, it's kind of quite the opposite. The, uh, I feel like that's <laughs> most of the case with most yogis. We discover to help, you know, calm a little bit of chaos we have in our lives at least that resonates with me so for sure for sure I think yoga attracts um you know people like that because they need something to calm them down or, or still their mind so um yeah I mean we grew up in, in a yogic family and what I mean by that it kind of translated into everything we did from you know how we ate the our food I grew up vegan and vegetarian most of my life um, right you know, just little things like saying gratitude before your meal, having gratitude circles and meditation circles with my brothers before we went to bed, um, you know, <laughs> yoga in the morning. So just little things that kind of connected, you know, anything that came up that was challenging. We, we, were, we were taught the tools on how to really um, take them as more as gifts instead of, um, you know, things that can kind of shake us up. And, and I, I'm, that's what I'm personally most grateful for growing up with this kind of background is just the ability to handle life's obstacles with more ease and more grace as well. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, the, at 17 years old, I decided to, you know what, I'm going to start taking this seriously. I quit all my sports because I was, I was pursuing a lot of like basketball and different athletics and, and took teacher training. And then that's kind of the rest is history. You know, I moved to LA yeah. just like you. So mm -hmm. it's cool to see your story kind of begin in the yoga world LA is like the mecca of yoga and oh, of um, course <laughs> in North America for sure <laughs> yeah you know it is it's like there's India and then there's LA yeah <laughs> <laughs> but India is like an interesting place we can get into that you know the yoga is almost I hate to say it but it's like being lost a lot of the Indians unfortunately like a lot of that whole world is like copying the west 
when in fact oh, we were kind of okay. I haven't been to India yet, so I'm going to see this summer, but it's interesting to hear that perspective. Yeah, there, you know, it depends where you go, but like, I think anywhere in the world, they like to copy what Americans are doing because it's the yeah. next trendy thing. But in fact, the Americans were copying, you know, the of Indian. Of course, it's so crazy because we're the ones that are kind of culturally appropriating the practice, right? So it's interesting to see that it's, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, my uncle always says this, he says this so funny. He goes, we took you know, most of yoga was actually meditation and pranayama practices. Like, I'm sure that's why, you know, LMU is having you work on this specifically because that was the majority of yoga. And my uncle says, you know, yeah. if you live there, you couldn't even find a yoga studio back in the eighties where there was a physical practice, you know, it was all pranayama yeah. meditation. But of course, you know, there's that 1% and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but America took that 1% that's physical and made it a hundred percent. We're obsessed with our aesthetics and our, you know, how we look and things like that. And it's a better selling point for sure. But um, oh, it's cool you're going back to the roots. Yeah, of course, that's it. A lot of times we've had these discussions in class and it's just like the physical practice is a little bit more accessible for Westerners, but you're not wrong in saying like originally the asana was to support meditation. So the postures were to do that. So um, but, you know, the practice has evolved. So it's good that we have these discourses and conversations so that people can be a bit more aware of, I don't want to use the word authentic practice because it has evolved and there's so many different lineages and different, you know, but yeah, so we can at least be maybe more aware of the roots and the other aspects of the practice that we don't see as much in class. So, um, so I think it's fair to say that you were exposed to pranayama through your yoga practice in that case. So um, I guess, how would you define pranayama um, based on your experience and um, why do you think it's important? Why do you practice it in your own yoga practice? Beautiful question. You know, pranayama is, um, you know, it starts with the word prana, which means energy or life force. Um, and I think pranayama is the way to literally move that energy and life force. That's like, the, the best way to explain it. And the best way to move your energy and life force is with your breathing because it's the thing that's keeping you alive. Um, so, you know, one thing about the breath that's interesting is it's the only voluntary and both involuntary mechanism in your body. So like, if you think about your heart beating, right? It's not like you can just tell your heart to stop beating. Oh, yes. Whereas your breath, you can hold your breath. Yes. So, you know, when you can actually start to control something that you would naturally do without thinking about every single day, um, there's a there's a power to that. There's a, a way to influence your 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 nature, your structure, your being um, with your breath. So it's so powerful beyond like what words can describe. But kind of coming back to your question is like, what is it and 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 why do I do it? I would say, I mean, gosh, there's so many benefits, but <laughs> I would say like, I think most people go throughout the day um, holding their breath. I mean, come on, it's like a, a epidemics. I'm sure you've heard of like sleep apnea and all these like yeah. modern illnesses. That's so so yes. yeah. You know, and, and even without us thinking about it, whenever we're stressed out or we're constantly holding our breath or restricting our breath, and you can see it in all different types of forms. Like if you ever listen to a happy baby breathe, it's like super deep and it's in their low belly. And that's kind of like our natural, I think, form. But then if you ever like visit a sick person in the hospital and you hear them breathe, it's very short, shallow. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people that the quality of your breath directly translates and correlates to the quality of your health. It's yeah. like, you can't distinguish them. So really through pranayama, the reason I do it is just to strengthen the quality of my breath, which eventually will hopefully translate to the quality of my health and, and just uplift my entire um aura and being and, and vibrancy so thank you <laughs> that's so wonderful awesome and um so you are you had mentioned you had started when you're 17 awesome I'm sorry I'm just looking at my questions that I have on the side yeah. to see what else um okay do you have a designated space I guess to practice um it's, do you practice at a specific time of day hmm. as well um as far as pranayama goes uh yeah I, I, I like to practice in the morning Okay. As far as this, the actual physical environment doesn't really matter to me just because I'm always moving around. Yes, you travel around. Like it's important even, I mean, don't get me wrong, a, a sacred space is, is definitely incredible to have if you're fortunate enough to have one. Um, but I think ultimately we're preparing to breathe 
through difficult moments. So if you're actually putting yourself in, in different situations and positions, you know, anyone can practice pranayama in their air conditioned yoga room, you know, with, yes. when, when the lighting is perfect and you got the incense going or whatever, you know, but you know, what happens when, you know, someone cuts you off or, you know, you're faced with, with compromise and then it's like, oh, it's way harder to take a deep breath. Yes. You know? I remember hearing that Ephraim loves my favorite movie, of course. <laughs> I know every time I say this, people laugh at me, but it is. That's like kind of, you know, also I want to go get my teacher certification in Bali. So, you know, exactly. There's a the love element. There's the self-development element, you know, so it's my favorite movie. And I remember um, Julia Roberts, I forget her name in the movie, but she was like in a meditation room and she was like struggling with her meditation and she was sharing how like, uh, she was speaking with one of her friends there and she's like, I don't know how I want to decorate my meditation room. And th that was like consuming her thoughts and her mind. And he's like, the meditation room is inside. So I think like that relates. And I didn't express that as eloquently as I would have liked, but just to say, it's like, it's nice to all have a, a, a special place, I guess, where you can practice, but also being able to um, access it from within whatever place you are in case of moments where, you know, you are presented with challenges and, and you need to breathe through them. Yeah, no, that's well said. Well said. I think that's a great like life metaphor. And I think, you know, the, the important thing is, is like, especially for you, you know, you're studying all these, these yogic practices, but like eventually, you know, you can read about it and write about it, but eventually you need to experience it directly for yourself. Oh, yes. life. Yes. And um, there's a quote, I think it goes like, I'll kind of shift it for pranayama, but it's yeah, like meditation and pranayama doesn't mean to be in a place free of adversity mm -hmm. but it actually means to be in that place yet remain calm and balanced yeah throughout. so like people think when you're like meditating or you're you're doing pranayama practices that you're you're in this place free of any kind of struggle or like but it's actually the opposite you're actually in that place directly but through your breathing and through your meditation you can remain calm yeah, and you're able to better navigate, you know, the challenges. Exactly. I think that's a good, like, you know, just perspective and paradigm shift for people to have that are maybe just starting out or people that have been doing it for years, because it's like, we're doing this for a reason, you know, it's not just for, uh, not just for our good lucks. No, for sure. <laughs> but I mean, that, that gets some people to the practice, but I feel like it doesn't keep them there. You know, I think all of us that have discovered the practice have really enjoy the more esoteric practices and you know the self-reflection and introspection that has come with the practice so that's what keeps uh, keeps us hooked um, <laughs> um okay so you had mentioned ujjayi are there any other techniques that you practice uh, that you're familiar with or if you want to expand on your ujjayi practice a little more the floor yeah so ujjayi is a, a cool one it, you know if, for those that don't know um ujjayi means victorious Mm -hmm. And um, I always like to tell my students that victorious, it, it's a victorious breath. And, and I, I like to tell people that because every conscious breath you take truly is a victory mm -hmm. uh, over all your fears, over all your doubts, over all your insecurities, you, you know, the, the power of a conscious breath or like an intentional voluntary breath is, is so important. So I think that's like almost the biggest benefit to Ujjayi, as well as like the sound through the back of your throat, the Gladys, that kind of that sound really just helps your mind to focus on the breath. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, probably one of the biggest reasons they give such an importance to the breath in yoga is because it literally just brings your mind to the present moment. Mm -hmm. Because your, your breath is always in the present moment, no matter what. It's that involuntary, involuntary mechanism. So it's always going. So as soon as you pay attention to it, you're right there. Um, Very fair. I love that. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, when you're... Uh, you know, when you're, when you're breathing, you know, they say that there's like physical benefits as well. Like, you know, you can build heat. Um, some people say that, I, I think that's a little abstract. I don't think it actually makes you hotter. Um, some people think it has more detoxifying properties, you know, when you really active, actively force the exhale, yes. but I think you can get more um, detoxification from like pranayamas like Bastrika or Kalabakti, which are very similar. Bastrika, if I'm familiar, is like an active inhale and exhale. So it's like, yeah. and, then, and then Kalabakti is just the active exhalation where the, in, the inhale is just a rebound. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, they call it the breath of fire as well. And um, that one's super, super powerful. And then yeah. I do that one probably the most, like, especially before I've been doing like a lot of the cold immersions. Okay, nice. 
And I thought it'd be interesting to bring this up for your project. I don't know if it would make sense, but you know, it's interesting to kind of see some of these pranayamas come to life in the modern world. Yes. Like no, no harm on Wim Hof, but you know, yeah. this guy blew up for doing this breathing before entering the cold. And he's been able to like witness these incredible, like inhuman, you know, powers. People I are like do a little like, bit more research on Wim Hof, but yes, please do share. So I'm learning yeah. as you're sharing. Yes. He does this like big breath where it's like almost like a hyperventilation, but it's like, okay. It's very, very similar to, you know, ancient pranayama. So, and he was a yogi. So he basically, I think he does give credit, but he like stole these like ancient pranayamas and has like brought it to the masses, which I think more so is a gift than a curse. I, I don't think it's an issue at all, but it's just cool to see like the old modern way of yoga breathing being shifted into this mainstream where now everybody's Wim Hof breathing, but they're really just doing pranayama. It's this, that kind of ties back to the, conversation about cultural appropriation even in my class something interesting that we learned about like uh, oftentimes when we hear the word yoga we think of it in terms of the physical practice but it, it isn't there's so many elements to the practice and we should be calling it yogasana so at least people <laughs> so things something like that you know just modifying what we're referring the modern names of these practices as so that we can give credit and honor to you know the so the, yeah that ties in most people, most people don't even really know you know what yoga means or what asana means and there's, true. there's some true. Different... <laughs> even at that as someone who's studying science great i do but you know <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a really cool um definition you know asana the word asana um like in, in your, what do you think it means? Or like, what, what have you learned that it means? I'm just curious. I, um, I would, I think of it in terms of posture, bodily postures, but uh, I, there is a breakdown. I, I'd have to go back to my notes. I don't recall a top of yeah. my that, That's definitely one. Cause like, you know, you're right. If, if you say a yoga asana, that means like yoga poses or like yoga. Yeah, the yoga of poses. Yeah. But if you really, and, and you might want to ask your teacher this or run this by, but if you really break down the word asana, the word asana actually means to sit still, mm, so then, which, yeah. is, which, is, which is interesting because it's like, wait, why would they tell you to sit still mm -hmm. in a physical pose? Because it means both. Mm -hmm. and then you really think about it and you're like, wait a second. They want us to do the physical poses so we can sit still in our minds. Yes. So the poses are just tools to quiet our minds. Of and course. once I made that connection, I'm like, ah, this all makes sense to me because I'm no longer doing triangle pose to touch my head to my toes, but I'm doing yes. it to, to strengthen the, the benevolent qualities of my mind, you know, like. Yes, you know, and that's work. where the generating heat actually comes in, the tapas, being able to cultivate that heat, that power, that strength. So I think, unfortunately, get it's lost in translation, but I from what I'm understanding through my studies, that's what is meant by the generating the heat through the yoga practice, hmm. the inner strength, the mental, you know, uh, qualities and all that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe we're a little off topic, but um, yeah, you can feel free to rope it back into the pranayama. I think we, we left off at like Wim Hof kind of taking these ancient practices of pranayama and, and bringing them to the mainstream and people are finding incredible healing benefits. Yes. Being able to sustain cold temperatures for longer periods of time, immune systems going up, um, yeah. you know, just from breathing, you can strengthen your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, obviously, um, your lymphatic yeah. system, that's your skin detoxifying, you know, that your word. nervous system, nervous system, that's the probably the biggest one, you know, your nervous system is the biggest one. And then, of course, you know, that's tied in with your stress and yes. things to speak on that. So that's wonderful. Thank you. And yeah, one of my questions was to speak about the health uh, benefits, physical and mental. So you touched base on that. Um, have you had any subtle body experiences that you'd like to share or, you know, has any of that ever happened? Yeah, when you say like subtle body experiences, what do you mean by that essentially? I guess um, beyond just the physical that you would experience just uh just i mean subtle body i mean i guess coming into awareness with you know just having moments those aha moments or Definitely. awarenesses where you're you feel connected with source energy you know there's different ways i guess to, sure. uh, no, no, no. I get, I it. It. If, you know <laughs> i'm still trying to understand all the metaphysical myself so it's hard to put into words yeah like i feel like i'm like not the yoga teacher to like, you know, tell you I um, experienced samadhi during my one hour breathwork yeah. session. 
But, um, you know, I like to keep things like really concrete. So just like the everyday person can kind of understand them. But, yeah. you know, definitely I've done, we do this one breathing exercise where we, we breathe for one hour straight. Okay, wow. We, you can basically just change pranayamas throughout. You just have to consciously breathe the whole time. Even if that's coming back to a natural normal breath, just for like, you know, a minute or so to like catch yourself and, and reset. But it's one hour of intentional breathing. And that's probably the most um, transformational breath work experience I've ever had. I, you could say I kind of like in the most, again, like abstract way, like left my body for a second. And like, you know, your whole body's like vibrating and you feel like um, kind of stone on oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you kind of like, you get kind of lightheaded and, and you kind of go into this other place. And I, I, I'm careful saying that because I don't think that's ever the goal, you know, of breath work. But I think it, it, it can be a cool thing to experience, you know, because just through your breath, you can, you can take yourself to, to really cool places that a lot of people think you need, like ayahuasca for, yeah. you know things that are outside of yourself and stuff like that yeah yeah um what did I want to say on the breath though oh yeah and and I don't know if this is in you know if you're interested in this but my breath work actually it's funny that you you asked me to do this conversation because I feel like right now I'm at a place where the breath work has been the strongest it's ever been oh, and nice. for one reason specifically is I started free diving okay which is well, essentially yes, you definitely need a practice <laughs> which which is kind of ironic because you're holding your breath mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I learned how to lose my breath okay. until I, is when I really found it and it, it's a, it's a nice play on words and I always tell students like sometimes the best way if you're struggling to find your breath if it's just like so subtle like even in meditation if you can't feel it coming in and out the best way to find it is to lose it first and oh, um, sure <laughs> And, you know, like coming up for that first breath of oxygen after a deep dive is like so rejuvenating and, and you really just start to understand your breath and how oxygen works and how your lungs and your diaphragm and your contractions and how and it so really works on a scientific level and you feel it um, with pressure and in that free diving, just in general, I could go off into a bunch of um, tangents, but there's a really good breath, a book called Breath by James Nestor that maybe okay. Thank you, you for sure. Sure. He talks about pranayama in a, in a modern way. That could be a cool thing to, to work on or, or check out. But anyways, free diving in itself had taken my breath to a whole nother level in my practice. Wow. Well, that's it. Sometimes also like we discovered through yoga practice, but there's other, you know, physical practices where you really see it coming into play. I would imagine, you know, free diving. That sure. would definitely be, you know, a priority. Even the preparation to free dive, right? It's like you don't want to hyperventilate yourself for certain reasons like before a deep dive but like still being able to control the breath and really bring yourself to stillness before a dive is like is so key of course thank you for sharing that's cool um and then i guess i have a uh, few last questions if you will uh yeah. i don't want to honor your time and are you still okay with time or do you have to head off soon we're good okay perfect awesome <laughs> um okay so um do you perform any purification practices performing uh, before engaging in breath work? Like, you know, there's a tongue scraping and all that, or people say room, is there something that, um, you know, works with you? Um, I wouldn't say consistently. Okay. I mean, I have, like I brush my teeth. Mm -hmm. I would no, we all do, yeah. <laughs> Necessary. Actually, uh, well, actually did, not everyone. So. <laughs> I did tongue scrape this morning. I, I just got a new one because I lost it traveling. <laughs> And um, that's always nice. You know, you don't ever realize how much, you know, stuff is there. Yeah, of course. It's nice to cleanse. Of course. Um, I like to do some Nali Kriya before okay. um, breath work, which is like the deep intestinal cleansing where you like bring your low belly in and out kind of fast on an empty breath. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Now, one of the Shat Kriyas, not everyone does that in their practice. So it's cool that you do. That is part of the, uh, the classical, you know, elements of the practice. A lot, just to quickly share with you, a lot of... Um, classical hatha yoga entails like a lot of the purification practice you so one of them is that so it's cool that you mentioned yeah that. i learned that in my ashtanga practice a lot of the ashtangis nice. do that to start it's like one of the first things you do because it helps prepare you for a lot of the twists and it yes. really helps your digestion everything i mean the yogis knew what they were doing it's like so weird looking it looks like belly dancing but it's like <laughs> It's honestly a game changer. So Nali Kriya is, is the move. And, and I forgot to mention two other pranayamas that I do often. 
And those are um, Baya Kumbaka okay. nice. and Antara Kumbaka. Okay, nice. And there are two. And then Baya Kumbaka, and you can like confirm all this after, mm -hmm. <laughs> but is, um, is exhale retention. So it's, it's, empty, it's, it's emptying out all the air from your lungs. So there's like no oxygen left and you hold your breath. Okay. And this brings you to like your diaphragmatic contractions way quicker, brings you to your edge way quicker because you have no oxygen to live off of. That's a super powerful one. And then antara means inhale. So antara kumbhaka is inhale retention. So you take a big inhale, belly, mid, chest, and then you hold. And that's, so it's, a, it's an inhale hold. So essentially they're both breath holds, but vice versa. Do you practice them at specific times or it's just, you know, whenever you feel called to? Um, I like to do them before meditations. I like to do, okay. um, I usually teach them in my classes, like, okay. with, yeah, just to get people, like I said, the best way to find your breath is to lose it. So yes. usually like when I'm building the breath in that second doorway of my class, it's nice to just get the students to hold their breath for a moment because after that, their breath is so much stronger the rest of the class. Oh, 100%. So I'll teach that really often actually. And um, nice. alternate nostril breathing is a pretty good one. Yes. Um, I struggle with like some septum issues. So for me, that's really okay. beneficial to like, you know, force the breath to come in and out of different nostrils. Wonderful. Okay, yeah, nice. That's it. And then, sorry, you. what were you asking before that? Um, um, the purification practices, but you oh. had mentioned like the tongue scraping, you know, if there's anything else that comes to mind, please do yeah, share. Yeah, like um, I like to use, uh, you know, some Palo Santo. Yes, we all do that too. I like to light some candles. I love that it's nearby. <laughs> I have, um, you know, some crystals. Of course, okay, just to help, you know. Some plants. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you can create a space, I'm all about it. I think that... Um, you know, the lighting is really important. Like music is, I'm, I'm, I love music. So True. when I had gone to your class, it, it was like a very energizing, stimulating class. So I love that the music like match that energy, like help, you know, it helps. Definitely. Yeah. You yeah. know, we try to use, I don't want the, the music to ever be too overwhelming and distracting, mm -hmm. but we like intentionally use it as a tool. That's why you may have noticed throughout the class, it wasn't just a running playlist, but mm -hmm. there were moments of silence. And then, you know, as soon as we were flowing on their own, the music turned on. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs> and then I guess um, my last question for, I guess two last questions. Um, you obviously have a strong foundation in the Ashtanga yoga practice, power yoga, I'm assuming vinyasa as well through your father. Um, have you ever dabbled with like, or um, had exposure to Sanskrit texts or classical Hatha yoga? Um, honestly, no, my, my, my background is in Ashtanga. So okay. um, through that, I've kind of dabbled with Sanskrit and, you know, okay. I know some of the numbers and the, you know, the, the poses and different yeah. words that have, have had deep meaning for me, like um, karuna, compassion, anicca means impermanence, change, metta, you know, loving kindness. Those kind of words are super, you know, close to my heart and, and I use them for specific things. Practice. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would love to explore the language more. So you're, you're inspiring me. For sure. There you go. I can share some resources with you, of course. Uh, and then my last question. Thank you so much, by the way. This has all been like your input has been very valuable. So it, uh, it's great. You, I'm glad I, I was having some, some performance pressure. I, uh, no, not at all. You're great. You know, I've never gotten interviewed for a college course, I, I, you know, <laughs> especially coming from a college dropout. I, I was a little nervous. <laughs> No, well, look at you now. <laughs> and um, my last question, I guess, is um, what is your process for guiding others in class? I mean, you can uh, talk about your physical, like in terms of when guiding students through asana as well, but I guess when you're in, uh, cueing the breath work, uh, mm -hmm. how do you assign um, the breath work that the students will be uh, engaging in? Um, deciphering what is appropriate for them in that moment is it more intuitive or do you kind of go into class with you know a idea of the breath work techniques that you want to practice or yeah what's your process uh, so you might have mentioned I won't go too much into it because that's like the <laughs> teacher training talk but um, <laughs> so, um which maybe you can come in September <laughs> sure. out. um yeah so like the the first doorway we call sacred space, and that's kind of just inviting students in, you know, giving them a second to just chill, whatever, you know, people come from all walks of life and different environments and situations. So when you first come on your mat, you just want to let them be. Mm -hmm. And the second doorway is when we start to bring them into their breath. So 
generally this short section of class, anywhere two to five minutes, you can introduce any pranayama, which is really cool. You know, you can introduce some kundalini activation or maybe it's just getting them right into their ujjayi. But generally for an Ashtanga vinyasa based class, the goal is just to carry the ujjayi throughout the class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that's just giving them cues or reminding them, you know, especially in those tough parts of class where you want to hold your breath instinctually. Um, but as far as like how I guide my classes, that's kind of how I choose is like in that, in that section of class, I'll generally pick one of, you know, the, the four or five I just mentioned. Yeah. Whatever's um, in your Just to get them into it and then return them back to Ujjayi. Cause that is the foundation yes. of the style of practice. Um, and if they can't do Ujjayi, you know, it's no big deal. I just tell them to just do a deep, a full deep diaphragmatic breath, you know, just cause not everyone can do the, the throat thing. And yes, at the end of the day, it's, it's important, but it's not like a make or break. So as long yeah. as you're consciously voluntarily breathing, you could just lay there. You know, I always tell my students, this is a breathing class. Everything I else. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, everything else really is optional. So as a, in, in, if all you were to do is just lay on your mat and breathe for an hour, you'd still leave the class feeling changed. Yeah. And that just shows you, you know, how powerful the breath is. Um, so that's kind of like the foundation of where I teach. And then of course, you know, every yoga teacher knows that, you know, the certain breaths follow certain movements. So inhales generally equal the length of an upward movement where you're lifting your heart or your heart is moving upwards. And then your exhales generally equal the length of your downward movement, like a forward fold or yeah. you know, any kind of movement where your heart's going down. Of course, it actually helps to facilitate, like according to the mechanics of breath, it does actually help to facilitate our practice. So beyond it, you know, just having these. It's not um, just a rule, like it actually, yeah. like you can tell someone that's on the street that's never done yoga, like raise your arms up over your head and take a little back bend. It feels weird to do that on an exhale. Like, like yes, exactly. exactly. So it's intuitive, like you said. Of course. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. I really appreciate you being able to connect with me and just share, you know, uh, your experience in the yoga tradition. And yeah, I've got a, a lot of valuable insights. So I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm so glad we got to reconnect for a bit in Venice.